Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, before I introduce my guests this week, just a couple of notices. You know, we've been rolling out our locals program. Well, we have two events coming up uh, in established uh, branches. Uh, one of them is in Birmingham and the other one is in Norwich. Now, the one in Birmingham is a social event. It's actually happening today, Sunday, as we speak. Um, if you would like to go along, find out if it's still time, um, uh, the details and the venue, then just please get in touch via a locals at newcultureforum.org.uk. And the second one is on the uh, Sunday, the 18th of February, and it's in Norwich. And in fact, this time uh, we have a speaker, and that's Paul Embury. You might know him from the TV, from GB News. He's talking about his book, Despised, Why the Left Loathe the Working Class. That should be great. That's actually in Norwich. On It's a Sunday, the 18th of February. Um, both events are free. Uh, so as I say, please get in touch uh, to locals uh, at newcultureforum.org.uk and we can give you details. Now, my guest this week uh, was an MEP for the Brexit party. Uh, ben Habib is now the deputy leader of the Reform Party. And this is quite a big week because he is standing in this week's by-election in Wellingborough uh, on Thursday. Thank you very, very much for coming in, uh, Ben. Thank you for I've having got, me on, Peter. I've got that right. It's Thursday, isn't it? Thursday the 15th. Yeah. 15th to 15th. Um, for reform, of course. Yeah. Uh, ben, uh, I just want to pitch you into the, right into the deep end, maybe or not. Um, but when you look at Wellingborough, which is in the East Midlands, isn't it? Yeah. Um, when you look at all the things that are happening in the country and what people are putting up with, um, whether it's economically, culturally, all of these things, how have they affected Wellingborough? You know, if you take that as a place, how is it playing out on the ground, whether it's immigration, whether it is cost of living crisis, all of these different things? What is your impression uh, in Wellingborough? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't think Wellingborough is unique in what it's experiencing. Mm. Uh, there are many towns across the United Kingdom that are suffering the same symptoms that you know you are self-evident in Wellingborough as you walk around. And it, it's an interesting question of yours because people say to me, well, you're not local, Ben, to Wellingborough. How do you understand the local issues? The issues that we're facing as a country and every town in the United Kingdom is facing, including many parts of London, are driven, I think, more now by national failings than they are by domestic council inadequacies. When I say domestic, I mean within the constituency. And, and the reason I'm in politics is because I see the national threat. I'm not in politics because I want to tweak tax rates a particular direction or deregulate just a little bit more than uh, the, you know, the current regulatory environment creates. I'm not in it for minor adjustments in policy. I'm in politics because I think the country needs an absolute handbrake turn in the direction it's heading in. And Wellingborough is suffering from all the national issues that I wish to address. So, for example, take the town centre of Wellingborough, un not unlike many other town centres, retail has been decimated. It used to be a vibrant market town. It's now um, heading towards dereliction, really? lots of empty units, the Swansgate shopping centre. Is, it's, got, it's got occupants in it, but it's a shadow of its former vibrant self. And of course, it can't pull itself up by its bootstraps because it's suffering very high business rates, so making it expensive for retailers to re reoccupy. The planning system is incredibly highly regulated. That needs to be deregulated so you can bring it into use in more modern forms of relevant use rather than trying to you know, stick with what isn't working. And, um, and then, you, of course, you've got net zero, which makes it extremely expensive to change uses because you've got to make everything net zero compliant. Mm. By 2027, properties have to be EPC, that's Energy Performance Certificate Rated C. 80%, uh, uh, sorry, 60% of the properties in this country do not comply with that regulation. By 2030, you need to get to B. 
80% of properties don't comply with that regulation. So you've got a town centre that is literally dying on its feet yeah. because of the burden of tax, the burden of net zero, and the burden of, of a restrictive planning regime. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's happening right across the country. And then you've got another big complaint in Wellingborough is the rate at which the demography has changed. Um, the rampant immigration that the country has suffered, this complete open border approach to immigration, is self-evident in Wellingborough. Um, you know, people are very, very concerned at the rate of change of the local population. And the burden that that's putting on the NHS, housing, mm. education, you know, all of, when you have a rapidly increasing population, particularly one that's coming in as unskilled labor and undercutting British workers, you have a, an immediate social and economic impact on the, on the area. And you see that again in Wellingborough. And then the other thing that Wellingborough experiences and people, locals are concerned about is knife crime, yeah. the increase in drug taking, mm. the absence of policing. And of course that too, as we know, is a national mm. issue. You know, we see knife crime and, uh, and serious crime up right across the United Kingdom. Um, and we've seen a breakdown in the confidence that criminals used to have that if they c commit criminality, they will be apprehended, detained, yes. and then convicted. Criminals are now emboldened. Mm. They believe they've beaten law enforcement and the judicial system. And of course, in many respects, they have. Mm. Only 2% of serious crimes result in a conviction. You know, that's, a, that's, that's lamentable, isn't it? So you've got all this multiplicity of stuff that's going on as a result, I think, of the national plight that we're in, mm -hmm. but manifesting itself in Wellingborough yeah. at a local level. So when people say to me, Ben, you're not local, you don't understand the issues, I'd say to them, it's not about fixing potholes, which is a symptom of the breakdown in the United Kingdom. It's about getting to the, to the roots of this weed and pulling the roots out. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm in politics. That's why you're in politics. So if you look at the people in Wellingborough, do you sort of, what is their demeanor? Do you feel, do they feel defeated to you? I mean, because there is a sort of sense, I feel anyway, uh, wherever you look, of a malaise. Yeah, absolutely there is. And it's a function of a number of things. Um, but ultimately, it comes down, I think, to the absence of aspiration, the absence of a sense of belonging, an absence of enthusiasm and optimism for one's future. I think the vast majority of the people in this country are feeling like they've had the rug pulled out from underneath them, that the system isn't looking out for them. The system is damaging them and the prospects that they have and the prospects that their children have, mm -hmm. that the educational system is letting them down, that the NHS doesn't serve their needs, that the police aren't doing their job. And most of all, that the, uh, I call it the indigenous population of the United Kingdom, are almost not welcome in their own country. Mm. And we can talk about diversity, equality and inclusion and the rampant form of immigration that's taken place. Um, but that has all in the human spirit um, created a void of aspiration and optimism. And I believe that aspiration and optimism, a sense of belonging, a sense of um, uh, comfort in one's own area, uh, th these are crucial things to feeling good about yourself, mm -hmm. feeling good about the country, feeling good about the way you're eking out your life. And people have been stripped of that. Mm. The ever increasing interference of the state in our personal lives, the creation of this sense of dependency that we're one organism, we're not individuals, where our aspiration is, um, is, uh, is um, nurtured, we, are, we have that dumbed down. We're all mm. told we're cogs in a wheel. And of course, I'm digressing slightly, but we saw that in spades in lockdown, didn't mm. we? We were told that you can't make decisions about how you wish to go through this pandemic mm. on yourself, taking risks that you may wish to take. We have to take risks collectively mm. and there must be no risk in the pursuit of the avoidance of risk. We've dumbed ourselves down completely. I mean, I've touched on a lot of different subjects there. No, no, but I mean, yeah. that's a crucial thing that it's sort of is what part of our culture is safety above everything else, isn't it? 
yeah, safety. The precautionary principle has killed the human spirit. Mm. And of course, then you've got immigration, cultural division, diversity, equality, mm. and inclusion, which in my view is neither diverse nor equal nor inclusive. It's mm. the opposite of all of that. Mm. And that's all been very damaging to the state of minds of British citizens across the United Kingdom. I mean, I think there were people watching would say, dead right on all of that, agree with you completely. What, what is different about reform then? I mean, a lot, most people watching obviously will be very, very aware of reform. Yeah. Um, it is pretty much, when it comes to smaller parties, the only game in town at the moment. Uh, but how would it, uh, how would it actually how, What are we going to do? What issues? are we going to do? Yeah, yeah. in Wellingborough. Yeah. So, so, so the first thing to recognise is that politicians need to start making policies and decisions with the British national interest and with British people's interests in mind. Mm. I know that sounds kind of basic and you think they'd be doing it, but they're not. Mm. They are, they're, they're indulging their own ideologies at the expense of the United Kingdom. Mm. Um, so we would slash immigration. Multiculturalism isn't working. Immigration does not serve an economic purpose the way our political masters would like us to believe. It is damaging the economy. It is undercutting British workers. It is burdening the NHS, housing, our infrastructure, education, which I've touched on earlier. Slash immigration. I would enforce our borders. What We cannot be a nation state if we don't have enforced borders. Yeah, yeah. And border enforcement does not mean deportation. You cannot look at border enforcement through the prism of deportation. Deportation is what you do when border control has failed. Mm. We have to man our borders physically. Mm. And if the Navy won't do it or border force won't do it, we need to develop a force that will. Mm. We need well-trained people with the right equipment to make sure illegal boats do not get into our territorial waters. Or if they do get in, they're turned around and sent straight back to France. And we have all the legal rights on our side to do that. We don't even need to leave the European Convention of Human Rights. Mm. I think we should leave the European Convention, but it's not a prerequisite to get a grip of our borders. Yeah. So that's how I would deal with that problem. Uh, and that would mean wages would rise in the United Kingdom. Mm. Absolutely. And then the government may fear inflation, but you fight inflation with interest rates. Mm. You don't do it by undercutting the British worker. Mm. If interest rates need to go up because people are earning more, more money, so be it. The other crucial thing we've got to do is reinstill this aspiration. And I think at the heart of creating aspiration is the prevention of undercutting people's wages, but also you've got to cut taxes on the working and middle classes. It's got to pay to work. They've got to know that when they work, they will be allowed to keep that which is legitimately theirs, not the state's. So we've got to cut taxes on working and middle classes. We've got to cut back dramatically um, the policy of net zero, ditch the policy of net zero, in fact. Fine, we all want a clean environment. We all want the betterment of the planet. But you don't do that by em economically emasculating the British people. Mm. So we've got to ditch this incredibly inflationary march towards getting rid of perfectly good gas boilers and replacing them with heat exchangers, perfectly good internal combustion engine cars, replacing them with electric vehicles. We've got to start getting fuel out of the North Sea again. We've got to mend the damage done to our own gas storage facilities, become energy independent domestically, mm -hmm. create cheap fuel. If you create cheap fuel, you get rid of this incredibly burdensome drive to, towards net zero. You reduce the entire pressure of costs on the British people. Would you, would you therefore, were you in favour of fracking, for example? I would absolutely have a go at fracking. Fracking, um, uh, it may prove not to be what we hope for it to be because you don't know how much gas you can extract until you've actually had a mm. go at fracking. Mm. But I would absolutely have a go at fracking. If you look at America, America was a massive importer of oil. Even mm. though it was the biggest producer of oil, it was a big importer of oil. And that had m very damaging geopolitical effects for the globe because it was always out looking for oil in places it shouldn't be going. They then started fracking. They've become independent mm. uh, in terms of energy. They've become an exporter of fossil fuels. Bizarrely, Peter, we've shut down the North Sea and we're now importing gas, liquefied natural gas from the US at vast cost and vast carbon emissions to get it here. But America understood that to become 
to, 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 to be viable as an independent state, it had to be yes, energy independent. Yes. And it's fracked its way to prosperity. Yeah. The American economy, for all their wokeism and all the r ridiculous regulations that they've got, that we, we've also got, actually, it's ticking along really well because they're energy independent, yeah. because they have driven their economy forward. R ridiculously, we've turned our back on our domestic fuel before we've created any alternative source of fuel. If we've done it completely wrongly. So, you know, Reform UK would change that. We would ditch net zero, cut taxes on the working middle class, ta cut taxes on sole traders, get rid of IR35, mm. which has been so burdensome. Halve our corporation tax rate. It may, capital, global capital is fluid. If you want to attract it to the United Kingdom, you've got to give it an environment in which it yes. can make money. Mm. We are now charging a much higher tax rate than our European uh, countries than the European countries are. Um, cut it from 25% per annum to 12.5%, to, to, to um, you know, corporation tax. Make uh, rocket propel the United Kingdom. And when the government says, oh, but you've got to have funded tax cuts, that is such a falsity. When did they fund all these massive expenses that they've incurred for the country over the last 14 years. If everything had to be properly funded mm. and had been over the last 14 years, we wouldn't have seen national debt go up by a staggering 1.3 trillion in the last 14 years of conservative government. Everything would have been fully funded, right? Yes, um, yes. But national debt's gone through the roof. They can find the money, 1.4 trillion for net zero. They can find, find, find 500 billion to lock us up. They can find 200 and 50 billion to rescue the banks in 2008. They can find 4 billion per annum to house illegal migrants, 5 billion to fight the war in Ukraine, but they won't cut our taxes because yes. that's the final straw. Yes. They're talking garbage. Yes. They need to cut our taxes. They don't want to do it because they want the money. Yes. That's their problem, but they need it for the economic organism that is the United Kingdom and that crucial aspirational feeling that voters and the electorate and people in the United Kingdom have to have to go forward positively. I think actually, yes, I mean, well, on, on net zero, I think you were being very conservative there. I think the latest estimates are not just 1.5 trillion, it's something like 3.5 trillion. I'm sure. I'm using yeah. the government's figures. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the government, yeah. yeah. I think those are the latest things. I have to go back to this one. On uh, migration, you mentioned slashing migration. Yeah. Um, the reforms policy has been characterized as being one in one out uh also it's been characterized as being what you might call net zero migration what exactly does that actually mean because in the kind of mainstream now it's no longer um you know forbidden in fact you hear it quite a lot to talk about actually sort of a halt you know you, some people like the stp even have a policy of uh, you know, a, mem a, a moratorium. And indeed, in the old days, uh, UKIP, when I was in UKIP, they, they started off with the idea of a moratorium. Um, how does your one work of one in and one out? Um, I think that's a quip by Richard on net zero. He talks about net zero migration right. as, a, as a kind of quip um, on net zero, the policy on energy. Uh, I, I take a different approach. And I think the only approach and the one that Richard and Reform will take is effectively to genuinely introduce a skills based immigration policy, mm -hmm. not requiring, as this conservative government has, a minimum wage of £26,000 per annum in order to be able to qualify for a working visa. That's 25% below the median wage. Mm -hmm. That is the embedding of importing mm -hmm. cheap labour. Mm -hmm. what, what, what it should do is set the level at £50,000 mm -hmm. per annum. Minimum, minimum, and let wages rise. Mm, mm, mm. Let wages rise, right? Mm. Let British people earn more. Sure, that creates internal pressure on our workforce, but we need that. Six million people in this country, Peter, are surviving on universal credit to a greater mm, or lesser yeah, extent. Yeah. That's 20% of the workforce. We need wages to go up. Two million of those six million aren't even looking for a job. Mm. One and a half million are looking for a job and can't get it. The other one and a half million are working to some extent and, and, and claiming on the state because they can't make ends meet. That is a third world economy. Mm. We, need to, we need to make it a genuinely skills-based immigration. I'm not mm. against immigration, by the way. I think if rich people 
very knowledgeable people, the best brains in the world wish to come to this country. Great, let's have them here. That's what we've done for hundreds of years is mixed with diversity of thought for the promotion of the betterment of our country. We've done it naturally as a nation. No, no problems with that. I've got a real problem with importing cheap labor, mm. unskilled labor, mm. not the best brains in the world, undercutting British workers and promoting the minds, the good minds in this country to leave the country. Mm -hmm. You know, last year we talk about net migration of three quarters of a million or whatever it was, roughly that figure. Actually, gross migration was 1.3 million. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, aspirational Brits who can't have their aspirations fulfilled in the UK left our shores. Mm. That is not what we want. Yeah. We don't want to be dumbing down the people in this country. We don't want a brain drain to be replaced by cheap, um, untalented people. We want the talent to stay here, don't we? Mm -mm. But it's sort of, in a way, you see the, the idea of talent, like, you know, who could sort of disagree with that? But uh, the way that people now experience this uh, is they would sort of roll their eyes, I think, if people talk about you know, we need the brains and everything, because this is the way it's been justified for absolute years. But yeah. all they see is just, not just sort of cheap labor, they see un unprecedented historically, a kind of movement yeah. of people, of young men specifically. Yeah. You know, this is the thing. It seems to be of a different order entirely. I mean, there is, do you think, um, Nigel, who's the president, Nigel Farage, president of Reform, um, he talked recently, and I think quite rightly, about there being a serious security threat now with our, with our migration. There um, is, of course there's a yes. security threat. Well, no, you yeah. say of course, but I mean, for a long time, one couldn't even actually even say that particularly. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. And I mean, I think this case, for example, of the guy with the acid, uh, throwing the acid, that's, that's really highlighted it. But on all sorts of fronts, it seems to be, like in America, a massive security risk, isn't it? it it's a huge security risk. It's massive. And you, you'd be blind not to notice the risk when you see the antipathy displayed mm. by the 300,000 people, mm. for example, that yeah. march from Hyde Park to Nine Elms on Armistice Day, you know, eschewing our historical... Yeah. Um, you know, uh, 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 that incredibly important day in British culture, mm. remembering those who died for this country, is chewing them, turning their backs on our day of remembrance and promoting, which Suella Braverman accurately described as a hateful ideology. Mm, mm. And that's happening on our streets. And I went to have a look at that march and many people were wearing band Hamas bandanas. You know, it's a, it's a terrorist group. Mm. We've got his butel terrier or whatever, I can't pronounce it properly, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, espousing hatred. We've got people in our police who are so police uh, 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 boards, uh, police boards who are associated with uh, with, with um, groups that uh, hold this country in contempt. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is all happening and multiculturalism hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other failing, which we haven't touched on, by the way, is if you are going to have integration, uh, immigration, you have to have integration. Mm -hmm. You can't, multiculturalism doesn't work. You can't be um, celebrating lots of different cultures all coexisting in mutual antipathy mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom. It's not the way forward. We need a settled social construct. And, and, you know, we haven't talked in detail about diversity, equality and inclusion, but of course, diversity, equality and inclusion also embeds multiculturalism because what it tells you is that if you're from an ethnic minority, an ethnic, uh, uh, from a, a minority religious background, you are not required to make any steps whatsoever to integrate yourself. The majority in this country should take the knee to your culture, yes. that we should subjugate our own culture and our own beliefs and our own value system to your value system and we should give you jobs and we should promote you into uh, into the boards of these companies into our police service into our armed forces we had the armed forces and we have the nhs all recruiting based on immutable physical characteristics rather than recruiting on whether someone's a good pilot or a good doctor mm. um i think we had the head of aviva the other day say that you know she hauls up her recruitment committee mm. if they recruit white people. I hope I'm not yeah, slandering no, yeah, Aviva. I think yeah. it was Aviva. Um, and, 
you know, all of this is abhorrent and it's wrong and it's bad for the economy apart from anything else. We should be doing everything on a meritocratic basis. What would you do when it comes to the diversity, inclusion, equity uh, policy? Uh, how would you do that? Do you think it should be scrapped? It should be scrapped, absolutely. You don't need a minister of common sense, Esther McVeigh, to bring common sense to government. Mm. You need to implement common sense. Mm. Woke hasn't just suddenly produced itself as a fad. Woke has been regulated and legislated into existence. Mm. And diversity, equality and inclusion is w one of the key ways it's been done. Mm. You know, so the stock exchange requires boards of directors to be mixed ethnically, mm. gender wise and so on. The Financial Conduct Authority requires it of, its, of the members it governs. The Financial Reporting Council, which is the regulatory body for actuaries and accountancy firms, requires not only that those firms that it regulates practice DEI, but that all the firms with which they them, themselves in turn work with mm. practice it. Mm. And that's how they've got this thing going through, the, going through the economic organism that is the United Kingdom in a kind of sexually transmitted disease way. You yeah, know, yeah. that's what, it's like a virus yes. that has spread mm. through the UK. So we need to make it illegal. Mm. We need to say it's illegal mm. to, to practice progressive discrimination. So not just sort of in the public sector then. I mean, this goes through all the, yeah. it's pri it's, mm. oh, it's everywhere. It's in the private sector. Mm. It's in the public sector. It's in our educational establishments and it needs to be made illegal. Mm -hmm. Its practice should be made illegal. Mm -hmm. That's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And we've got to tell people when they come to this country that you've got to learn English. You've got to pay allegiance to king, the, 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 you know, the king and country. You've got to swear an oath, whatever it is, make an oath for the United Kingdom. You've got to, you've got to become British mm -hmm. if you come to this country. It's not that we're going to become Pakistani or we're going to become Indian to, to make you feel comfortable. You've got to become British. I think one of the, the problems, uh, you know, obviously that requires you to hugely, uh, you know, reduce, as you say, immigration to make it work. But I think one of the crucial things there, Ben, is that in order to integrate, we also have a, an establishment who pretty much don't just discourage integration, but they can sort of they have a distaste for their own country anyway. They do. Our establishment and, hates the country. Mm. That's why I said, when I said, this sounds weird, at the, when I started talking about reform at the outset, I said, you know, we've got to start making policies for the United Kingdom and yes, for the British yes, people. Yes. And our, our government doesn't do that. And that's clear. Our government, our, uh, the, all parliamentarians, with the exception of maybe a handful, actually hold this country in contempt. Yes. They think that it's backward looking and small minded to be, proud of being British. That's why they allow, the, I'm sure your viewers know this all very well, that's why they allow the decolonization of the English language yeah. to be a thing. How is it that Oxfam can produce a 92 page report saying the English language needs decolonization, mm. that the words mother and father are somehow offensive? Mm. This is absurd. Mm. It is absurd because it hijacks our ability to communicate with each other and it immediately Put pits us against our his, our history. Yes. It makes us ashamed of our the decolonization of the English language is not just an undermining of the language; it's an undermining of our culture. Oh. It makes it impossible yeah. for us to understand the context in which we exist. And of course, the attack on our history is the same. The the the, the claim, you know, all you get nowadays from Archbishop Welby, indeed the king of this country, is that our forefathers were slave traders. We mm. never get told about the good things our forefathers did. The mm. creation of a fantastic. A country in the 19th century, oh. the exportation of mm. all the techniques and brilliant systems that we created in the Industrial Revolution, the exportation of our brilliant common law system, which still underpins global trade and has brought prosperity mm. to so many parts of the globe, mm. the policing of the shutdown of the slave trade at vast human cost as well as wealth to this country during the 19th century. You, I, uh, we talked of it before. Uh, I, I might be jumping ahead, but you said you you said you know I might ask you Ben who's one of your one of your heroes one mm -hmm. Nelson's got to be one of our heroes. Mm -hmm. He gave us the security that we needed from 1805 to yeah. 1917 yeah. The, of the high seas for the United Kingdom to become prosperous and to export that prosperity. We did not go abroad and just nick wealth. Yeah. Let me tell you, I was born in post immediate post-colonial Pakistan. It was a peaceable, rich country. 
that the, the Pakistan into which I was born was a much, much better country than it is now. Mm. And that was because of the systems, the infrastructure, the legal system, the way that we did trade, everything was much better mm. in the po immediate post-colonial world. And I, I've had that firsthand. I don't need to read a history book yes, to yes. know that I'm telling the truth. I was there. Mm. Ben, you know, when we look at the polls, sorry to, to go back to the grubby daily, uh, day in, day out of politics, but you look at the polls, reform's doing pretty well, isn't it? It's on like 13%, I think, at the moment. Um, you're the most prominent of the uh, smaller parties. Well, it, what do you expect to happen in in Wellingborough? I mean, I know that that's a, a, an unfair question since you'd say, well, I'm going to win. But I mean, how, what is your feeling at the moment? How How is reform being welcomed yeah. or not? So uh, obviously I'm going to win, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if you were to talk to people who might take a slightly more nuanced view of how the by-election might play out. Um, I think they would regard a, a good result uh, as being that Conservatives being pushed into third place in Reform UK mm. coming second. Um, I actually can't predict what's going to happen. Mm. I can tell you that anecdote, all I've got is anecdotes, right? Mm. Because all I do is meet people mm. and mm. I can reflect back to you what my anecdotal evidence is. Mm. But I haven't had people coming up to me on the streets in the way that they have in Wellingborough mm. since I stood for election for the European Parliament mm. when the British people were very, very angry that the, the vote for Brexit had not been implemented mm. and they wanted to send a very clear message mm. to Theresa May. Mm. And back then, walking around London, um, I had taxi drivers, well, being in London, taxi drivers saying to me, I'm voting for you. Mm. People coming up to me in the tube station. People, obviously, I didn't know that people knew who the hell I was, but coming up to me and saying, Ben, we're going to vote for you. Mm. And I'm getting that in Wellingborough. I have a drink. Well, you were there, actually, yes, yes. Uh, with me last week. And I was at the bar and a couple of people came up to me and they said, you know, I was a Tory. I'm now voting for Reform UK. And I'm getting a lot of that. And even right. Labour canvassers are telling Reform UK supporters, whom they don't know to be Reform UK supporters, yes. that the feedback they're getting on the doorstep is people are going to be voting Reform UK. Right. So I don't know what's going to happen on the 15th of Feb. I'm, I'm hoping that on the 19th of Feb, I'll be trotting down to the House of Commons. Yes, yes. No, absolutely. I, I, I just, it's, it's interesting because you see, um, I think the by-elections come and go, don't they? And people say they're very important. But actually, in some ways, this is very important for reform, isn't it? It's important for the country and it's important for reform. Yeah. It's important for the country because the, the political establishment need to be made to recognise that the people of this country uh, are not just apathetic, they're angry. They're angry with the settlement that mm. they've got. Mm. And the settlement needs to change. And it's important for Reform UK because I believe we're the only party that can really achieve a change in settlement. Mm. If the Tories or Labour are continuously returned to the Commons, we are just going to get more of the big state um, intervention, more borrowing, more taxation, more immigration, more aligning themselves with EU regulations that don't suit the United Kingdom. Mm. Um, you know, more of all of that. I think uh, the other thing as well, actually, is, a, uh, uh, is a something which people now pick up very much. The, the respect for politicians has gone. But in a way, it's quite understandable because it, apart from the lying, also the calibre seems to have dropped a huge amount in recent years. You know, that the actual people who are in charge now seem to be at the very most technocrats, bureaucrats, and that's about it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned there uh, about, you know, your early life. You came to politics, though, quite late, isn't that right? With the, yeah, 2019. Was it, with, was it actually with the Brexit? It was with yeah. the Brexit party. With the Brexit so party. So no, no political involvement really before then? None. I wasn't even a paid up member of the Conservative Party. I was a Tory donor. I became a Tory donor in 2018. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I partly did it because I wanted to understand what the devil was going on with Brexit. Yeah. And um, at my first meeting, I met Michael Gove and, you know, I'm, again, viewers will have had the mist lifted from their eyes, but the mist was very firmly down on my eyes. Right. I had always assumed until 
June 2018 that the political class was more or less doing the right thing by the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. I had twigged in 2016 that something was up mm -hmm. because Mark mm -hmm. Carney and George Osborne and David Cameron were talking rot mm. about what would happen if we left the mm. EU. And as a businessman, I knew what they were, were saying was just simply not true. Mm. Um, but uh, when I had lunch with Michael Gove, whom I thought was a Brexit hero because he'd fought for Brexit. Mm -hmm. And I realized actually this chap is really a secret Remainer, mm. you know? Mm. And then I, then I really, the mist started lifting and it's a bit like peeling back an onion, isn't it? Mm. Peter, every time you think you've understood the political mm. landscape, mm. you peel a bit more, you get closer to it, you look more closely at what's going on, you read a bit more and you realize, actually, this is really rotten. Yes, yes. What, what is your business actually, man? People it's a people, property fund management property business. Property fund, fund management. Yeah. And what, you've been doing that for many years? Or? Since 2000, the year 2000. And oh, right. And what, was, what were you doing before? I'm so I, I ran a prop... a sense of your life. Yeah, so I left university with a degree in organic chemistry oh. and did what any organic chemist would do, which is join the corporate finance department of Lehman Brothers, or <laughs> Sherson Lehman, it was, as it was called then. Um, you know, the choice between doing a PhD in organic chemistry at £8,000 a year and joining. Yes. And this is the point about aspiration. Yes, yes. You yes. know, I left, oh my goodness, wasn't I lucky to leave university in 87? Oh, yeah. The world was your oyster. Yeah, you yeah. were told in 87 that you can do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Maggie had put meritocracy at the heart of people's mm. belief systems. And I genuinely believed I could, well, if I worked hard, I could do whatever I want. And I want that enthusiasm mm. to come back, but I'm digressing. So I went to join Chess and Lehman Brothers, had a fantastic time there long before, um, you know, hit financial troubles. It was a really superb entrepreneurial bank. And mm. I won't bore you with the details of what I learned there, but it was fantastic. And then I went into, then I was finance director of a Lloyd's reinsurance broker for a few years. Oh, right. okay. And then I went into private property development in 94. Then I set up my own business in the year 2000, floated it, and then I, to a greater or less extent, have had success over the last 23, 24 years running that business. Right. And so, as you say, politics very, very late in the, in the, uh, in the game then. Uh, well, comparatively speaking, I mean, you know, to, to most people. Um, do you have respect for the political world? I don't have respect for our parliamentarians. No, no. I think they genuinely stand in opposition mm. to the people. They stand in opposition to the interests of this country. Mm. They're hijacked by party politics and personal ideologies and personal enrichment. Mm. And um, I mean, I've actually seen Tory MPs bemoaning the fact that they're going to lose their seats, not because they've delivered the country, as I believe they have, to the precipice of disaster, but because they're going to lose their salaries. Yeah, yes, yes. It's like, come on. Yeah, yeah. Is that really what's exercising your mind? Um, one thing just in conclusion as well, you, I think you said before, uh, you know, on quite a few occasions, you would like to see the Tory party basically pretty much annihilated, um, obliterated. Um, what are the chances of that happening, do you think, Bernard? I mean, reform I or no reform? I think it's happened. Mm. Um, they beat me to it. Mm. The reason I wanted to obliterate the Conservative Party is because I strongly believe, and I know it to be right, that when someone has failed so dramatically like they have, mm. they've got to be removed from office. Mm. You can't have a board of directors that's brought a com company to its knees still running the show, trying to make it. They're not going to be in a position to mount a recovery for the mm. company. Mm. They're part of the problem. The Conservative Party is part of the problem. When I say the party, I mean the parliamentary party. Mm -hmm. It's the parliamentarians who have done this. Mm -hmm. And I think at the heart of the problem of the Conservative Party is this concept of being a broad church. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, in my view, is that they're a divided church, unable really to join together and do anything proper for the mm -hmm. country. And it's the one nation lot that are calling the shots. And the one nation lot really should leave and join the Liberal Democrats because that is their philosophy. Um, conservatism has been completely lost out of the Conservative Party. They, they're in competition with the private sector. They're not the guardians of the private sector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to tax us to hell because the, the, the state that they've created is so hungry for capital that they need to borrow and tax or the whole thing is going to come crashing down. Mm. And they've got no idea of how to promote the private sector 
to get the economy growing because they're so caught up with wealth redistribution and state intervention. And so they've got to go. Yes. And then people say, well, you're going to get Labour, it's worse. But if you return the Conservative Party back into office, you will reward them for their failure mm. and they will just go on doing the same thing again. Mm. We need to get them out. And initially my aim was quite a destructive one just to get yeah. them out. And I realise now that actually I think we've achieved that uh, or the Conservative Party has done it for us. They, I think, are going to have a terrible election. So it is now incumbent on the Reform UK to get seats in Parliament. Yes. We have to get seats in Parliament because we've got to actually do something constructive. We've got to deliver our agenda. We've got to at least bring pressure on whichever government is that gets into power to bring pressure on them to deliver our agenda. And for those who are watching this and thinking, well, Ben, you're never going to be in government. You're never going to be able to deliver your policies. What I would say is even a handful of MPs from Reform UK getting into Parliament mm. will skew the debate in our direction mm. for the United Kingdom in such a dramatic way that we will absolutely prevent the kind of damage that has already taken place to this country. We will do it. Return me from Wellingborough on Thursday, the 15th, and you will see a dramatic change on the 19th. Right. Well, I mean, perfect note on which to, to end <laughs> a, a little uh, advertisement there. Um, ben, please stay with us because we just want to ask you a couple of questions for our members. Um, but otherwise, thank you very, very much. And uh, yeah, all the best for Thursday. Yeah. Thank you. Ben Habib there. Um, we shall see you next week. Uh, so have a good week in the meantime, won't you? Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, May I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.